receive our morning's tithes and offerings. And again, thank you for your faithfulness and giving to the Lord. Let me prepare you um, for next Sunday. One of the things we're going to do is we're preparing a um, prayer card for you in hopes that uh, it will cause us to think of people who don't know the Lord specifically, to pray for them, and then to look for opportunity to do two things. One is to share the love of Christ, and then secondly, to invite them to join you, uh, especially during this series as we go through uh, the book of Revelation here. And we start a new series this morning in the book of Revelation. The, the theme for this book is Jesus is coming. And the real question is, are you ready for him? Amen. And that's our hope that we can help people get ready to meet Jesus. If you have a Bible handy this morning, I want to invite you to open it with me to Revelation chapter one. If you don't own a Bible, we would love to give you one as a gift today. All you need to do is raise your hand, let our ushers know, and we will come to you and bless you with a copy of the New King James Version. And then likewise, you can follow along if you don't have a Bible on the screens behind me as well. We'll put up all the passages that we cover today in our sermon. And once you find that, I want to invite you to stand to your feet with me this morning. And as we do each week, we will stand and read his word aloud and then take a moment and pray. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 says this, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Let's pray. Father God, as we embark on a new series, we pray that, Lord willing, that over the next few months, we would be able to unpack the dynamic teachings of your word. But Lord, even in the midst of this teaching, our prayer still remains, Maranatha, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Lord, we look so forward to the day that, Lord, you return to this earth, and you reverse the curse, and you set all things in order. God, what a glorious day that's going to be. Because, Lord, for each of us, we only know what it is to be born into a world of sin. We're all born post-Eden. And yet, one day's coming. Lord, will you restore this world, our very lives, back to the way that you had originally intended things to be. And all because of your grace, not because of our merit, Lord but because of who you are. Not what we've done is Larry was praying and leading us in prayer that, Lord, we have no righteousness apart from you. Lord, our works are like filthy rags, but your works are perfect in all their way. And so, Lord, thank you that we have the opportunity for heaven today by placing our hope, our trust, our faith in the finished work of the cross and what Jesus has done. And so, Lord, as we go through this book, through this study, we pray that each and every time, Lord, we open its pages and read from them, that Jesus becomes more clear to us, because that is your desire for us, that we would have a revelation of who Jesus is. And so, Lord, we ask by your Holy Spirit, do that work today in us. Help us to see Jesus, Lord. We ask these things for your glory and for our good as we pray in Jesus' name. And again, we all said, amen. Amen. You can be seated. The book of Revelation, it'll shape our souls. It'll inspire us. And like I said, over the next few months, Lord willing, if he doesn't return, and there's nothing I want you to know in prophecy that is keeping Jesus from coming to this earth. Maybe the only thing that is holding him back is the fact that you have people in your life that still have yet to hear about the love of Christ and what a, a solemn responsibility that you and I have to pray and to minister his love to them. And may we be faithful in doing that in the days ahead. I mean, this book, um, we see powerful scenes. I mean, dynamic scenes. And if, if you're not a Christian today amongst us, I pray that by the time we get done today, you are. But if you're not a Christian and you go through the book of Revelation, I mean, it should scare you to death. There was a movie, it was called Scared Straight. 
And when you look at the implications of this book and to think that what's going to happen to those who have rejected the free gift of God, eternal life in his son, it, it really should scare you. And I pray that it does. I pray that it puts a holy fear in our life. But if you're a Christian amongst us today, you should be encouraged by what you see here. Because the good news is you're not going to be here. These are things that will unfold while you're in the very presence of God. And we'll study that in the days ahead. <clears throat> we know that Jesus is coming back. That's really the theme of this book. The devil is going to be defeated for good. We're going to know in the end that heaven is a real place. And we get to go there because of Jesus. Amen. There's two things that the book of Revelation should do in the life of the believer. It should motivate us to want to know more about this book. People read it. And I love when young Christians, new Christians, they'll be reading the book of Revelation and they don't get it, but they want to get it. And so what does it cause them to do? Go back and study the Bible. If you don't have a good handle on the book of Revelation today, it's probably simply because you don't have a good handle on the Old Testament. Because in order to understand the book of Revelation, you have to understand the imagery and the symbolism of the Old Testament. And so we'll, we'll unpack some of these things as we go along. The second thing that the book of Revelation should do in the life of the believer, it should motivate us more than anything else to share the love of God with others. Because if this book is true, and it is, people who have not received Christ will spend eternity in hell, separated from God, in a place where the Bible says that it's there's sulfur, that the, there's burning in the eyes, that the, 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 the our thirst is never quenched and says the worm never dies. I mean, it is a dreaded place that's beyond even our comprehension. It was not created for mankind. It was enlarged in order to inhabit him. But God's desire is not that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. But he created us with the ability to choose. Have you ever seen that bumper sticker that was around years ago that said, Jesus is coming soon and boy, is he P.O.'d. It didn't have the word P.O.'d on it, but I've seen it numerous times as I've driven around town. And I want you to know that, that that is theologically accurate. I mean, it would have been better, but it wouldn't have served the purpose for the bumper sticker. But we're talking about righteous indignation, that God is coming back with righteous indignation. If you remember, when Jesus came into this world in his first coming, his first advent, he came as a baby, right? He came as the lamb of God to take away the sins of the world but when he returns the second time he's coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah and we'll be reading this today and he's coming in vengeance against his enemies all enemies you might say foreign and domestic and it's going to get really ugly what I love about this, when we think about the book of Revelation, it's one of the few books that begins with a title, makes it easy to study. It's not that complicated in the truest sense as you unpack it. In verse 1, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. The Greek word translated there, revelation, it's the term apocalypse. In our culture, it's become synonymous with cataclysm, destruction, doom, all these types of things. But to the Greek reader, it simply would have meant an unveiling or an uncovering, or a revelation. So it's important to know that the theme of this book is the revelation of what? Jesus Christ. It's not so much about timelines and events. It's about the revelation of Jesus Christ. God's desire, his heart, is that you and I would see Jesus through and through in this book. It's not about the Antichrist. You know, it's been well said that the theme is not 666, but rather it's holy holy, holy. And as we'll discover, it's not just about unleashing God's judgment on mankind, more so what we see at the end of the book in Revelation 21 and 22, it's about the unveiling of Jesus Christ to the entire world. Revelation symbolism, though, uh, it's, it's enabled it to slip through uh, Roman government and through Roman security into the hands that it was intended to Christians to find comfort and to understand that God had a purpose and that he had a plan. And again, what better way to communicate in a hostile world 
is through codes or Old Testament symbols. And so the key to interpreting Revelation correctly, correctly is to familiarize ourselves with these Hebrew idioms and imagery that we see. And again, that means going back and studying the Old Testament. I don't know if you knew this or not, but 70% of the book's 404 verses, that's 278, they quote directly Old Testament references. And then on top of that, there is another 360 Old Testament inferences as well. And so it's very, very critical in understanding this book that you go back and you study the Old Testament. And again, that's why there's so much confusion about the book of Revelation. It's been well said that the best commentary on the Bible is what? The Bible itself. It's never more true than we study the book of Revelation. Look at verse 1 there when it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave to him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. So these things hadn't occurred yet. And we'll walk through this because there's some schools of thought that John was only talking about things that had already transpired. Can't be true. He's talking about prophetic things that have yet to occur because he says must shortly take place. It says, and he sent and he signified, and that word signified means to signify. It means that he's demonstrated by signs. God did signs and wonders. He showed him through pictures and the imagery here by his angel to his servant John. And you have to remember, you know, again, he, he explains who got this revelation. There's so much that we can easily understand as we go through the book of Revelation. John, the gospel of John, calls him the disciple whom Jesus loved. What a great name. And we know that for John's life because everybody has a circle of friends. Everybody has people in their life that they have influence with or over. And Jesus had 12 disciples, right? But he also had the inner circle, Peter, James, and John, who made up his closest friends. And then there was his favorite, you might say, friend. I mean, imagine that. Jesus had a favorite earthly friend, and his name was John. In all the pictures that we see of Jesus and John in Scripture, where's John at? He's at his right hand all the time, right? And where's his head? He's laying on Jesus all the time. I mean, that would personally bother me to have my best friend sitting and laying their head on me all the time, but I'm not Jesus. And John loved to be around Jesus. And so we, there's a love between them. And I, and I stress this because of the revelation that he gets. Because the closer you are to somebody, the more revelation you get of that person. It's one of the great blessings here. And God wants us to get this revelation. Jesus said, no longer, now it starts to make sense, do I call you slaves, right? But I call you friends, he says, because I've done what? I've given you great revelation. He goes, I've told you everything. And you would only tell your deepest, darkest secrets to who? Your best friend. And so John has this intimate relationship with Jesus. If you think about it, he was the only disciple to witness the crucifixion. Where were the other ones? They'd all fled, right? But John was right there. To his own mother, he said, Mother, behold your son, and son, behold your mother. Wow, to put your mother into the care of someone. John was that person. Very special relationship. John was the first disciple to see the empty tomb. I love this. Peter's in front of him, right? When Peter slows down out of fear at the tomb, what does John do? He finally catches up and passes him and goes flying into the tomb to see that it's empty. You know, your friend would do that, right? I mean, here's John. What a beautiful picture. He was there during the 40 days following Jesus' resurrection from the dead. He's walking with him. He's watching everything that's transpiring. And John is there when Jesus ascends back into heaven. And what we see is John is doing everything then that a faithful witness is called to do. Jesus told them, he said, to go into all the world, which you and I are part of this as well, as being a faithful witness to what Jesus Christ has done. He said, go into all the world, making what? Disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He says, teaching them all that I've commanded you, right? That's what a disciple does. That's what John was doing. And John was suffering tremendous persecution under Domitian, a Roman emperor in that time. Now, Nero had killed Paul already, and he had killed Peter. And now, here's Domitian. He is, his, history tells us that he tried to boil John in hot oil, threw him into a boiling pot of hot oil. And all he did was end up at a day spa. He had all of his hair that he didn't want came off. They brought him out. This is where women got the idea of day spas, by the way. I want you to know. No, he was hot waxing. And all of a sudden, he's what? He's clean as a whistle. 
And he knows he can't, he can't kill him because he's got God's favor. The safest place to be, church, in this world is in the center of God's will. The most dangerous place to be is any other place but the center of God's will. John is there. So what does Domitian do? He banishes him to the island of Patmos. It's like send him to Alcatraz. And what is John doing? And I, I almost don't want to go there. I, I went there in the first service, but I've messed it up already. I have to go there a little bit with you because I, I so love this book. I love teaching this book. I love everything about the book of Revelation. But I love it for a lot of different reasons. One, because I can understand what John was going through. I know that here's John. On the island of Patmos, it says in about verse 7 there, when he, on the Lord's day, I mean, you've got to picture this. He's there by himself. If you want to torment a Christian, here's what you do to him. Isolate him. See, because we are created for unity. We are created for community. And so if you really wanted to, and Domitian knew this, because we're to do what? We're to go into the world. We're to tell people about the love of Christ. We're to share the gospel, how people can get saved. Because John knew, he was fully convinced. He'd been there on the Mount of Transfiguration. He understood what was taking place. And he knew that heaven and hell were real places. And it was serious business in the kingdom of heaven. He didn't want anybody to miss it. Domitian's going, you know what? Here's how we torture him. We won't kill him. We'll let him live. But he just won't have anybody to share the love of Christ with. And you can imagine what someone would be going through like that. But then here's this beautiful thing because, see, I've shared this before. We go on vacation and what normally when we go on vacation, we tend to take a vacation from God. Oh, it wouldn't happen in John's day. John would have went just like the apostles. They went from city to city. And what did they do? First thing they looked for was a church. How, how many of us, when we plan our vacations, look for a church? Oh, Lord, let me see. I can't go there because there's no Calvary Chapel in the area there. There's no other church in that area that I could go and have fellowship with other believers. That's what drove their lives. That's what motivated them and what they did. And so here's John on the island of Patmos on the Lord's day. And he's going, Hey, today's Sunday. Well, there's nobody to have church with. I mean, he could have easily went, you know, well, then we just won't have church, but you got to picture what he did. It'd be like John going, all right, let's open our Bibles. And John would go, jump back up and he'd go, all right, turn your Bible with me. And he'd be playing both roles. He's role playing the whole thing. And you go, because it's the Lord's day. It's the, it's an opportunity to what? To have fellowship with God. And, and so here he is. And, but what happens? And the reason I stress this, there's a point to it. Because many of us, when we think about Jesus coming, we go, oh yeah, Jesus came in his first coming as a baby into this world. Oh, I get that. His first advent. Oh, and I get his second advent. Yeah, he's coming again. But do you know that Jesus is coming today? He is. He's coming to families that are struggling today. He's coming to marriages that are struggling today. He's coming to people who are struggling today with addiction. He's coming to any and every person whose heart is broken, who's looking to God and saying, God, save me. Because you look around this sanctuary. Just look around. You go, every one of us, if we said, hey, what day did Jesus come to you? It wasn't the same day. He came to you in your hour of need. And I want you to understand this, that if you're in that place today, guess what? Revelation 3.20 says, behold, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. He says, if any man would open up the door, he said, I would come in, my father and I, and we would have fellowship and we would sup with you and you with us. It's about a relationship. And so Jesus isn't just coming again. He's coming today. And that's what he did for John. And, and I, I would be amiss if I didn't stop for a second and help you understand that. Because what a beautiful picture when someone in the world isolates you. There's no other, I mean, if you want to torture somebody in this world, ignore them. Just ignore them. I mean, one thing, you know, when people get mad at other people and they're, and they're, backbiting and griping and complaining and gossiping you go at least you can know this they go there's something to do with love even in the midst of the distorted hate because if they really understood hatred they wouldn't say anything they just wouldn't say a word you'd be like the roman emperors you would be like when moses remember when when pharaoh gave up on what do you say about moses let the name of moses what be stricken let it be removed from all the records so that he doesn't even exist. That's what Domitian was trying to do to John. And when the world tries to do that to you, guess what? Jesus comes to you. And I don't know about you, but that, 
blesses me tremendously to know that that's the kind of God that we serve. Verse 2 says, Who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. So when John received this revelation, again, he was a prisoner, member of Rome. And again, the Roman government, they wouldn't have been too fond of a manifesto that predicted their own doom and destruction being passed out within their kingdom. And so to avoid censorship, you could say John's letter employed the use of signs and symbols here that would have been known to a student of the Old Testament, but not a student of the Roman government. Very good. Our God knows how to reach us. That's the message. God can get through. Maybe you have people in your life, you go, I've been praying for them. I just can't get through to them. That's okay. God can. God can. He has trust him. Lean not in your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. He'll direct your path. He can get through to them. Uh, the book of Revelation, for some, they would call this, this language that he used was a cryptogram or an encoded message. It's symbolism, like I said, was designed to get past the Roman guards, but yet Christians could understand it. Like Daniel, John was given a revelation of future events. He was commanded to write these things down, and he received this message, not from an angel, not from some outside source, but he received this message from Jesus Christ himself. And he said, write these things down because, what? They're faithful and they're true. They're going to come to pass. And that's why it's healthy. It's a blessing for me and you to read this book, to study it, to hear it, and to do it. And you go, why? And he goes, because he said, we'll be blessed if we do. Verses 17 through 19, you look down there in chapter 1. Again, we read about future events that are going to come to pass. And God told him directly what would happen. He says, this is Jesus speaking. He says, and when I saw him, speaking of Jesus, I fell at his feet as dead. You know, it's amazing how we approach God sometimes when we come into the church or whatever time we get here, you know, with just this not reverence for the Lord at all. It says, but he laid his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. So he's talking about being the alpha, the omega. He says, I'm the A, I'm the Z in the alphabet. He goes, I'm everything in between. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. So be it. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write these things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. See, the book of Revelation is John's account of what he saw and heard. He was trying to explain it in a language that we'd understand. Have you ever been someplace that somebody else hasn't been to and you're trying to explain it to them in a language that you think they'll understand? If you have kids, it's great, right? Because you have to really break it down. Well, that's what John's doing. He's trying to put this in kid language that we'd understand it. He's using symbolism here, word pictures, you could say. He's given us a prophetic message. It's like a dream or a vision. But it's all true. That's the key. It's all true. It's 100% true. And so what's the book of Revelation about? Ultimately, it's about end time prophecy. You think about this. Verse 3, it says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy. I love this. Does it say anything about understanding it? No. <laughs> Thank God. Amen. Amen. No, if you just read it and you hear it, there's a blessing that comes with that. But it extends it to, though. It says, and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written. That's the real blessing. David Guzik, in his commentary on Revelation, he wrote this. He said, since so much controversy has risen over the interpretation of the book of Revelation, it's helpful to know the four basic approaches people have used throughout the centuries to understand this book. I'm going to paraphrase a lot of this just for time's sake. Number one is the preterist view. This approach believes that Revelation dealt only with the church in John's day. In the preterist approach, and this is a growing approach even in our day today, Revelation doesn't predict anything. John simply describes the events of his current day, but he put them in symbolic code so those outside the Christian family, the Roman government, couldn't understand his criticism of the Roman government. In the preterist view, the book of Revelation was for those living in John's day. Well, we already know that can't be 
completely correct. It is correct to a certain degree, but he also said to write down things which what? Were still to come. Now you have to look at it this way. The grapevine is, is that way, right? Yeah, it is. And on a, and on a clear day, you can see it. Most days you can't, but you know it's there, right? But if you just say, in a dream, it's a clear day here in the valley. And you can see the grapevine. The grapevine's not moving, right? But if you take a step closer to the grapevine, does the grapevine become more clear to you? Yes. That's the key to understanding biblical prophecy. Those that are alive in the day when these things begin to happen, they're going to see it more clearly. It was stated as fact in John's day. It didn't move, but they were so far away, they didn't understand it. If you study Luther and Calvin and Spurgeon, you're not going to see as clearly as you can understand personally today what end time prophecy is about. Because they were so far removed because the end time is about what? Those that are there in the end times. It would make sense if you were there. It's happening in our world today. And we'll be able to, like I said, unpack some things along the way that will help us here. So the preterist view is one. Secondly is the historic view. This approach believes that Revelation is a sweeping, disordered panorama of all church history. In the historic approach, Revelation predicts the future, but the future of the church age. So it really focuses on chapters two and three here, and not the future of the end time events. So what it does, it tries to take church history and break it down over the course of time. Not a very healthy perspective because the only way then to understand you know, Revelation is to look backwards. And that's not the best way to approach prophecy because prophecy is always about what? What is forward, okay? So just some things that are real interesting, but they're positions that people hold for whatever reason they hold them. Uh, in the historic view, Revelation is full of symbols that describe now, for example, many of the reformers, this is like I said, going back to Luther and Calvin, uh, reformers called the Pope the Beast of Revelation chapter 13. But they didn't necessarily want to believe that it was the very end, so they believed that the that Revelation spoke of their time without necessarily speaking to the end of times. The poetic view, number three. This approach believes that Revelation is a book full of pictures and symbols intended to encourage and comfort persecuted Christians in John's day. We know that was true. Yes, that's very true. But not just in John's day, but also in throughout the ages. In a poetic or allegorical view, the book of Revelation isn't literal or historic. Revelation is a book of personal meaning. Danger, though, in that. There is no private interpretation, okay? All scripture is given by God, and it has a purpose. There's an intent of everything that John writes about. Number four, the futurist view. This approach believes that the beginning with chapter four, uh, Revelation deals with the end times, the period directly preceding Jesus' return. So right at the beginning of chapter four, many hold to that is a, a picture or a type of of the rapture of the church that takes place because in the preceding two chapters two and three you hear you know 16 to 19 references to the church but then the word church is never used again until we see in chapter 19 at the second coming those that would come with the lord now again that is a again position that many hold when you think of the futurist view it says in the futurist view revelation is a book that mainly describes the end times. Now, personally, I hold to the futurist view, and we'll walk through that. Like I said, but we'll give place to other positions, and again, uh, the key to the whole thing here is not to get in a debate and argument over this, because again, we see dimly darkly, but then we'll see face to face, but the key is that we all agree on one thing, and that one thing is what? Jesus is coming back, okay? And so any position, the bottom line, he's coming back, and then the second you know, aspect of that question is, are you ready? And that's why we proclaim and preach the gospel, because if you're not ready, I mean, all hell is going to break loose upon your life. So when you consider, again, Revelation, this book, look at it this way. Maybe chapters one through three are thought of being already fulfilled, talking about church history, talking about seven literal churches, and then, again, things that have already taken place. Then chapters four all the way through chapter 22 are things prophetic. They're things still yet to come. So we understand that the book of Revelation is a book of prophecy. It is yet to happen. 
So perfectly set as the last book in our Bible. I love exactly the fact that it's here at the very end. Unlike Daniel and Ezekiel, the book of Revelation is the climax then of both the Old and the New Testament. The book of Daniel, I mean, it describes in detail uh, events from Daniel's time all the way up to Christ's first coming, when you think about this. And then it, then it briefly talks about the tribulation period and Christ's rule on earth. But the book of Revelation magnifies and really brings to light the end times events culminating in what the second coming of Christ and the establishment of a new heaven and a new earth and again so the majority of the book of revelation is about what end time events things that are what yet to be fulfilled prophecy again like they said the imagery the symbolism of this book, I mean, it existed purely out of need because people go, why all the imagery? Why? Remember, the church was suffering tremendously under Domitian, under Roman rule. I mean, Christians were being killed. They were being fed to the lions. They were being tortured. So, you know, again, John's message was to get hope. You know, hey, to be reminded what the best is still yet to be. This is as bad as it gets. It's going to get better. But again, just to write that in plain language, I mean, it would have got everybody killed. And so they used imagery, like I said, symbols from the Old Testament that would have been so clear to them that have, have you ever forgot something and someone reminded you and it made you happy? It brought you hope or it brought you encouragement. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I forgot all about that. I share that all the time from the pulpit, right? We tend to what? Remember the things that we need to what? forget and we forget the things that we need to remember that's what the book of revelation is it's reminding us of the things that we need to remember jesus is coming back jesus is coming back that's good to know he is coming back and every wrong is going to be made right and the key is is do what then jesus is coming back is make sure what i'm right because if you're not right you're going to get what left Okay, so this it's so so important. Okay, I think we get that. Now, I'm really struggling in this part right here because once I'm done telling you about what I'm about to tell you, I really felt pretty good yesterday. I was thinking, you know, we're just going to go on to the, back to the Book of Jude. We're just we'll be done with Revelation after this. Okay, we can just cover this all in a day. We'll all be done. You'll have no more questions, or at least I'll have no more things to tell you about the book of Revelation after this. No, when you think about this, the book of Revelation, as you look at this as a whole in, in chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus claims to be what? The Alpha, the Omega. Like I said, the A, the Z, the beginning, the end. And again, like I said, he's not just coming again, but he's coming again. He's coming again today. My prayer is before this service is over, somebody reached out to somebody and you're here today because somebody invited you. You know you need Jesus. He's standing at the door of your heart. He's already knocking. You're just waiting for the very end when we pray and you go, I, I want Jesus to be my savior. And today it'll be the day that he came into your life. That's awesome. But he's also coming again a second time. That's what we, we start to understand as we go through this book. In chapter 1 and verses 9 and 10, we get John's vision. And like I, I just shared with you, I love that. I love the fact that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day and that Jesus came to him. And if you need Jesus today, be reminded of that. He'll come to you where you're at. The key is, is to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. You look in chapters 2 and 3 there. I mean, Jesus gives John these seven letters to seven churches there in Asia Minor. I was going to do a topical message when we get to that. I'll talk to you about what kind of heart do you have. It's somewhere between, you know, being loveless and lukewarm. The church at Ephesus had lost their first love. The church at Laodicea, they weren't. Jesus said, I wish that you were hot or cold. Think about this. This is after Jesus died on the cross, after the day of Pentecost, okay, after he has ascended back into heaven, and he's saying this about a church that exists in that day, and maybe it deals with the heart of an individual believer. I, I don't think it's far-fetching to, to proclaim that. But he says, I wish that you were either hot or cold. Because we know that if you're hot, you know, you go, hey, you're passionate. That's what he's dealing with. He goes, if you're cold and you're freezing, what is it going to do? When somebody gets so cold, they're going to do something to get warm, right? They're going to do jumping jacks. They're going to put a sweater on. They're going to do something, turn the heater on. But you don't want to freeze. But when you're lukewarm, how do you feel? And what do you do? You go, you pretty much do nothing because what? You're comfortable. Christianity in America is lukewarm. There's no question about it, I think, in any of our hearts and minds. And Jesus 
proclaims a, a warning. He said, I wish that you're either hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, his words, not Pastor Mike's, don't shoot the messenger. He said, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. You go, wow, that's not very nice. I didn't know Jesus talked like that. You go, yeah, he does. He's very serious because he's serious, as Larry was talking about in worship today. He's serious about our salvation because sin is serious. And when you understand what he went through on the cross because of my sin and your sin, then all of a sudden you start going, oh, this is, yeah. This isn't a warm, fuzzy, feel-good faith that we're talking about here. In chapter 4, like I said, at the very beginning of that, we see where John is invited up into heaven. Is that a picture of the rapture? Not sure. But we'll talk about that when we get there. Chapter 4, though, I love because that's where prophecy begins. He gives this wonderful description of heaven. There, chapter 6 through 11, he describes the four living creatures. I'm going to be gone during those weeks, so somebody else can explain that. In chapters 4 and 5, uh, we read about worship in heaven. Great chapters to read about worship. The adoration of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Chapters 6 and 8 uh, describe the seven seals, the rider on the white horse. They're, or it's going to deal with famine and death and all the things that we're seeing that are going on in the world. People, oh, are we, are we in the, the tribulation period? Well, not when you really look at the ultimate end. It'll deal with the trumpets there. In chapter 7, we'll see the 144,000 Jews who are sealed. 12,000 from each of the tribes. They're not Christians, okay? He literally says, oh, the Jehovah Witness, they, they spiritualized that and said that was, you know, the 144,000. You go, no, they're literal Jews. He goes, they're, they're, they're from 12,000 from each of the tribes. Makes 144,000, simple math. It is what it is. In chapters 8 and 11, the seven trumpets uh, will deal with the two witnesses. Amazing when you think about technology today and what's going to take place in the world. Again, still futuristic. Chapter 12 speaks of Satan. We, we see him there in scripture referred to as what? The red dragon. That's why at Halloween time, we were kids always, what? You could get a dragon costume. Hopefully none of you ever got a dragon costume. Had the little horns and the pitchfork and something. It came right from this. Hopefully it was more like Michael the archangel. You had your wings and... And you walked around the neighborhood and people gave you extra candy because you, you, were, you were heavenly. Chapter 13, the, the beast from the earth, the beast from the sea, it'll deal with the six bowl judgments of the, of the wrath of God. Armageddon, the conflict of Armageddon, the fall of Babylon. We're going to see Babylon, the fall of Babylon, not just spiritual Babylon, but economic Babylon, two separate entities. And we're seeing that being uh, fulfilled today, right in our very midst, in our lives. And we'll, we'll deal with that. In chapter 19, we see the marriage supper of the Lamb, the second coming of Christ. And again, we'll read here in chapter 19 about the Antichrist and all those are with him being utterly destroyed. Chapter 20, Satan being bound for a thousand year reign and then ultimately judged for all eternity. Then in chapter 21, Eden restored. Think about that. Life as we've never known it. Like I said, we were born into a post Eden world and then to think that one day God's going to restore he's going to reverse the curse we're going to see what it was like before the fall of man what a day that is going to be a new heaven and a new earth a new Jerusalem and then in chapter 22 Jesus final message hey don't add to this book don't add to the prophecies that are in it don't take away from the prophecies that are in it read it hear it and what do it and guess what? Your life will be blessed. And he says what? Surely I am coming quickly. Being reminded, don't lose sight of that. That's why revelation is so important. Because if you knew Jesus was coming back tonight, this thing about this, make it personal for today. He's coming back tonight. What impact would that have on your life? Oh, if you really knew that he was coming today. Oh, man. The house, who'd be caring about cleaning the house? Nobody would be thinking about that today. I'd be cleaning the inside of my heart. You know, you go, Lord, you know, you'd be just getting everything right with him. Every person that, you know, you've ever had a problem with, you'd be calling, hey, I love you. I want you to know we're going to get this settled today. Jesus is coming back tonight. You know, and I've never shared Jesus with you. I want to share Jesus with you. God loves you. You know, we'd be given. Here, here's money. You'd give it to the Mormons. You wouldn't even care at this point because you're going to be gone. You're going to go, it's just about blessing people. We're just whatever. It takes. You can have our church. Uh, we don't care. Turn in whatever you want. Why? Because we're not going to be here. Carolyn had brought uh, months ago, there was a CD in our safe and she gave it to me and she's like, I wonder what this is. I found this in there. And I realized what it was. It was 
a CD that was produced for people who are here after the church was raptured. It was in our safe. It was like, if you bust into our safe and you get this, we want you to know, here's, here's why we're not here. Listen to this. And it was how to get saved and, you know, um, all the things that you need to do in order to reach heaven when the church is gone. It was pretty amazing. But he's, surely I'm coming quickly, that we have that motivation. So we're going to have all kinds of questions that, that rise from this book. I mean, you're going to go, when's he coming? Is he coming? You know, he doesn't say he's going to come like a thief in the night. Okay. But when he comes at his second coming, everybody's going to see him. Zechariah's prophecy is going to be fulfilled. Every eye is going to see him. And the Jews who are alive in that day, they're going to go, oh, this is him whom we crucified. Because they're going to ask the question, where did you receive these wounds? And he'll say, in the house of my friends. Oh. It says their eyes are going to be opened in that day. Again, see, our culture, we have, because of the internet, we have really messed up the book of Revelation. There are so many thoughts. I mean, it would take you longer, seriously, it would take you longer to scour the internet and read all the positions on the internet than Jesus will be back before you could get, you could get to them all. That, that's what's so sad about it. And that's how the devil works. There are just so many things. Oh, it's just about knowledge. We'll just keep, and you go, no, 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 no. No, God wants us to grow in truth. That's the most important thing. But can we know everything? No. Do we have perfect theology? No. Not at all. Like I said, 1 Corinthians 13, 12, put it this way. For now we see in a mirror, what? Dimly. But then face to face. See, that's the greatest joy of the book of Revelation. And I'll share that with you at the very end. There's a great joy. We're going to see him face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I'm known. It's been well said. When angels need good laugh, what do they do? They read commentary. Okay. <laughs> They do. They read comments. Hey, look, these guys, look what they say about this. You know, people ask, what's your take? Are you pre-trib? Are you mid-trib? Are you post-trib? Like I said, my favorite, favorite study was one that Bob Coy did. And he said, maybe God will take you according to your faith. And I love that. I think that's the way God should do it. I, I love that. If you're pre-trib like myself, I don't want to suffer. I don't know about you. I don't, I don't want to go through pain. I like the idea that God would, and, and I see that consistently in scripture because we're the bride of Christ. I don't know too many husbands that want their wives to suffer, at least if they're a good husband, by the way. You go, Jesus would take his bride out. But maybe, you know, if you don't really like your wife too much, and I know some of you are that way, you know, that you, you'd probably go, you know what, three and a half years is not too long for her to suffer. You know, it's a way to get back at her. You go, and if you really didn't like her, you'd go, oh, I'm going to save her, but you know what? <laughs> She's going to pay. <laughs> and this, I'll let her go seven whole years, and at the end of that, oh, I'm going to save her. You know, and you go, I can see how people have that mentality. You go, and, and Bob Coy was like, hey, you know what? Uh, I, maybe that's how God will do it. I go, I, again, that's up to you. But there is different positions. There is pre-trib, mid-trib. There's pre-millennial, post-millennial, you know, all these things. And we'll try to cover those as much as we can. But really, again, there's technically, there's two second comings. There's, the, in 1 Thessalonians 4, Jesus comes what? In the clouds. That's what we see. And then here in the book of Revelation, it says he comes, what, with the clouds. So he's in the clouds, with the clouds, and you go, with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Is every eye going to see him in the rapture of the church? No. It says he's going to come like a thief in the night. It's going to happen. You know, and guess what? The church will be snatched away. Rapizio. People, oh, the rap that word rapture is not even in the Bible. Yes, it is. The translation of it, yes, the rapizio to be raptured, to be snatched away, taken up. That's what the Bible says that's going to happen. Jesus in the rapture comes in the clouds. He'll surprise the world. And then he's coming back with the clouds on the final day. He'll touch down on the Mount of Olives and he'll put an end to man's rebellion against him. He'll establish a political kingdom during the millennial. And again, we'll have peace on earth like we've never, ever known it before. Sandy Adams, he put it like this. He said, since Jesus ascended to heaven, he's been sitting at God's right hand. He finished his work of salvation, and his spirit has been busy gathering in his church ever since. But once the church is caught up, God's wrath will come down. A Christ-rejecting world will be punished. Today, many people around us uh, might mock at the idea, but they won't escape. Vance Harvner writes this, some of us get laughed at by the swivel chair experts in eschatology, speaking of end times, 
But when God splits the skies and the stars fall and the moon turns to blood and men cry for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them, it's going to be pretty hard for some of us to keep from saying, I told you so. See, Jesus came to earth the first time to pardon. And we need to understand this. But in his second coming, he's coming to punish. He came to pardon and now he's coming. to. You do not want to be here for that. <clears throat> and hopefully it motivates us as we go through this book to go deeper into the word of God. And hopefully it motivates us to reach this lost world around us, to love people enough. Because I don't know what you're going to say to Jesus when he's going, hey, aren't you glad I saved you? And you go, yeah, Lord. And he's going to go, what about all these? Da, 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 da. <sighs> I was busy. I was busy. I hope that we're not too busy. There's a question that needs to be asked. Are you ready for his coming? H.A. Ironside in his commentary on the book of Revelation writes this. The word of God bears witness of Christ. That's what this book is all about. It's about revealing Christ to us. And so my prayer is you, church, would love people enough that, yes, you'd invite them to church. Is it about growing the church? Yes, it's about growing the church. It's about advancing the kingdom of heaven. It's that our side wins and the devil's side loses, that there's more people in heaven than there are in hell. And you and I have been selected and chosen of God to participate in that. And again, as I shared with first service, I go, I was listening to a radio program. It was one of these three-minute programs on 102.5. It was really cool. It was a woman in ministry with her husband and her family. Their whole family was in this ministry, and she was talking about being a fisherman. And she said, you know, some people are committed to building, you know, buildings that talk about fishermen. And they, they spend all their money on things to, to, you know, teach and educate people on fishing. She goes, but I want you to know, she goes, unless you fish, you're not a fisherman. You can know everything there is to about, about being a fisherman, but if you don't fish, are you really a fisherman? Jesus said, if we would follow him, he said he would cause us to become what? Fishers of men. He said his disciples were fishers of men. If you're not fishing for men, are you truly a disciple of Jesus Christ? And the answer would be very clear, no. Oh, you might be someone who talks about fishing. The devil talks about fishing, but you know for certain the devil is not going to fish for people in order for them to be saved. No, it's like I've shared, you know, it's been well said that, you know, it was Deal Moody made the statement that the devil made a pact with the city of Chicago is that churches would be full on Sunday that, you know, men and women would come fully dressed, you know, just looking, you know, dressed to the nines, that children would be obedient to their parents. They would acknowledge people, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, all this kindness. And he goes, there'd be no drinking, no swearing, none of these things. He said, but Christ would not be preached in those churches. See, the devil's not against, you know, prosperity. He's against Christ. He's against the revelation of Jesus Christ in anyone's life. And that's what we've been called to minister to. It isn't, oh, but I serve in the church. You know, I pastor a church. I teach a Bible study. I'm on a worship team. I sing. Oh, that's my job. No, 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 no. No, we all have the same job. And that is to go into this world to every tribe, to every tongue, and to preach the gospel that men and women might be saved. We can't save them. All we can do is what God's called us to do. And that's water and plant. And he gives the increase. Amen. That's what the book of Revelation does. It drives us to this place where we're going, he's, ser he's really serious about this. My friend John Snodderly, who I have come here often, he said this in a sermon once I was listening to. He said, there's a lot of rabbit trails in the book of Revelation. It's okay to take rabbit trails, John said. I just don't like to take them all the way across the United States. And it's so true because you're, it's real easy to get on a rabbit trail in the book of Revelation. But where does a rabbit trail equal, or excuse me, lead you to? A hole in the ground. So know that. So just be careful on the rabbit trails they get into because people get caught up in, you know, what's the beast going to look like? What is he going to, you know, it's all these things. And you go, wait, wait, it's not about that. It's not about 666. It's about holy, holy, holy. It's about revealing Christ to you. And if it's not taking you in that direction, stop. Doesn't mean it's not a direction. It's just not the direction God would have us go. In closing, there's three things I want to remind you of. You know, Pastor Chuck would always say to us, never trade what you do know for what you don't know. So when you're reading the book of Revelation, don't trade what you do know, do know for what you don't know. Stay on task here. 
But three things you can take with you as we go through this book, kind of a filter to look. Number one, Jesus is coming back. That, that's what it's all about. That's the prophecy. That's what we need to be reminded of. When you're thinking about sinning and about blowing it, it's a great thing to be reminded of. You don't have to say anything to anybody else. All of a sudden, they're, they're starting to do something you know, that they shouldn't be doing. Just go, Jesus is coming back. It's like the parrot, right? You're having a parrot. Jesus is coming back. And you go, that, that's all. Do you need to hear any more than that? If you're getting ready to go off task, you know, that's all you need. That's a good enough <laughs> message to, to, to go, oh, yeah, he's coming back. And when he does, he's going to set everything in order. Again, the undeniable truth. Jesus is coming back. Chapter 1, verse 1. The return is near. These things must take place shortly. 1, 3. The time is near. 1, 7. He is coming with the clouds. Chapters 12, 20, 22. He is coming soon. Chapter 16, verse 15. I am coming as a thief in the night. We see all these things. Revelation 19, 11 through 16. He says, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. Can you imagine what it was like when Peter denied the Lord? And Peter saw Jesus, and their eyes met there in that courtyard. It just melted Peter because Jesus' eyes are pure. They're like a flame of fire. And it says, in his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the wine press and the fierceness of the wrath of the almighty god think about a wine press what do they do when you step on grapes just just i mean that's how it's going to be and he says and on his robe and on his thigh a name written king of kings and lord of lords are we not clear on this jesus is coming back the key is are we living in anticipation of that the second thing that we see is satan is destroyed the devil is destroyed that's good news amen why is that so important I mean, I don't want you to leave without getting that today when you think about this. I mean, prophecy teaches us that evil will not have the last word. You have an enemy of your soul. Get this, church. You have an enemy of your soul that he goes to and fro across the face of this earth looking for whom he can devour. He wants to destroy your life. Jesus said the thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy. But Jesus came to give us life. Jesus wants you to have life, but the devil doesn't want you to have life. And what does he do to you every single day? See, most of us aren't even aware of how the devil works because he works through people. He works through circumstances. He works through situations. People that would call themselves Christian, being like a puppet in the hand of the devil. And you think, what does he want us to do? He wants us to give up. He wants us to quit. I love giving you refrigerator verses. Here's one that I pray that I bet nobody has this as their refrigerator verse. I'd be willing to bet you Salty's lunch, free of charge, after the service today. Because it'll probably be a little extra. Um, no, but think of this. Revelation 20, verse 10. It says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You need that verse. You know why? Because the enemy of your soul comes against you. And what does he do? He tells you about your past all the time, doesn't he? He comes to you and goes, hey, but remember this, remember this, and remember this. Remember when you did this? And that's all true. That's why you can't even deny it. You go, yeah, yeah. It should make us, what, thankful that I'm not saved by my works. I'm saved by God's grace. But what the devil can't do in that moment, he can't deny the truth of God's word. What if he told you about where you've been? You now have the privilege, the ability to stand on the promise of God and go, hey, devil, I knew, I know where I've been, but you know what? Here's where you're going. Here's where you're going. Amen. I'm telling you what, and you need, you need to understand that. That's why this book is so powerful. It's so profound because, again, we live in so much defeat because the enemy we forget that he's defeated because we think, oh, he's not defeated today. Yes, he is. He was already defeated. He was defeated at the cross. We're just waiting for what? We're just waiting for the, the clock to run out in the game. 
We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. He's coming back. The devil is defeated. And again, number three, God is going to rule and reign over everything. This is, I mean, I did a memorial service yesterday. I love, I hate funerals. I hate memorials. I hate doing this. But I love being able to tell Christians that, guess what? The devil didn't win. If your loved one placed their hope and their trust in Jesus, guess what? One day we're all going to be united together again. And this is the thing that I want to leave you with because it's about Jesus. See, we love reminding people in Revelation 21 about the presence of God, that there's going to be a day when there's a new heaven and a new earth, right? When God is going to, again, we see he's going to wipe away every tear from their eye. But I don't know if you really think this through too much. And I want you to think about this because it's been well said that the glory of man, or excuse me, the glory of God is man fully alive. The glory of God is man fully alive. It was Jesus' great earthly prayer. John 17, I'll read these two verses here with you, three verses. It says, Father, Jesus said in his great prayer, he says, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me, speaking of me and you, may be with me where I am. John 14, remember? Where I go, I go to prepare a place for you. So that they may behold my glory, which you gave and you've given to me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world ever was. This was already settled. This is a done deal. Beyond my comprehension, beyond my pay grade. But guess what? Not beyond his. Before the world ever was, it was already settled. O righteous Father, he says, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name. And I will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. I mean, think about this. All sickness, all disease is going to be vanquished one day when we sit with Jesus. No more sorrow, no more pain, no more dying. You're not going to lose another loved one in your life. It's all going to be restored, redeemed. Everything that was dead that was in God is going to be brought back to life. But look at this description of heaven. And I'll invite the worship team to come forward. But I want, I want you to lock in on this. Don't don't miss this today, okay? Revelation 21, 1 through 5, it says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, repaired as a bride adorned for her husband. It says, Then I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And look at, look at, don't miss this. And God will wipe away. Who's going to wipe away every tear from your eye? Jesus. No, put a name on it. Jesus is. Jesus is going to sit with you. He's going to take you in his arms. He's going to hold you. He knows every hurt and every pain, everything that you have kept bottled up in you because you needed to be strong in this world. Everything that that sought to destroy you on the inside that you have just kept and you have just tried to muscle your way through in this life. And he says, and God and Jesus will wipe away every tear from their eye. There should be no more death nor sorrow. Do you, do you believe today that Jesus knows your hurt? Do you believe that he knows your pain? It was one of the, the blessings of being able in a memorial. I shared the story of Lazarus and Jesus. And here's Jesus who loves people. And it says, and he stood outside the tomb of Lazarus. It says, and he wept. And you go, wait a second. He just said, I was glad I wasn't there when Lazarus died. So that way I could demonstrate the glory of God. He knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Why was he crying? Why was he weeping? And you go, he was crying and he was weeping because he identified with human suffering. He knew that we don't get it. He knew that we didn't know what God was capable of. He, he knows that we didn't understand that Jesus one day was going to make all things new. And so what did he do? He cried with us. We have a God who identifies our hurt and our pain our suffering, our sorrow. He says, and there'll be no more pain for the former things have passed away. And then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I what? I make all things new. And he said to me, write, for these words are true and they're faithful. So we have it in our Bible. We have it here so that you and I could do what? We could enjoy the realization that guess what? No matter what you're going through today, no matter how difficult the moment is that you're in the best is still yet to be that's why this book is so important in the life of a believer is to recognize that yes jesus came once 
But guess what? He's coming again. Now the question that begs to be asked today as we close, are you, are you ready? Are you prepared for his coming? Let's pray. Father God, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to stand at this pulpit and remind this congregation of the hope that's in Jesus. And Lord, I'm reminded of that saying that says people can go six weeks without food and six days without water and six minutes without oxygen, but we can't go six seconds without hope. Lord, thank you that you're our hope in this world. Thank you that you are coming. And it could be right now. It could be today. Maybe some are here today and they're going, I can't hold on any longer. Maybe tonight. That's the hope of the believer, that we don't know the hour at which Jesus will return. Maybe it'll be today. Maybe this is it. It's all over today. And for some of us, we're going to be like the 10 virgins. There's not enough oil in our lamp. We're not ready. We're not prepared. That's the beauty of going through the book of Revelation. It brings us to that place, that realization. His word is true. It's faithful. Tonight could be that night. Today could be that day. And living in light of his glory. And then having a heart, God's heart for people around us. And so, Lord, have your way. If there's any here today that don't know you as Savior and Lord, don't let them escape this place. Don't let them get out of here, Lord, without the hounds of heaven pulling on their heart to get things right with you. It's not worth being left behind. 